So the final part of, of, the, of my talk is uh, ablation. So you have to think about how, what do we want to achieve with the patient? We want to make them feel better and we want to improve outcomes. That's a, bit, that's a basic approach for any disease, right? In AFib, outcomes we improve by preventing stroke. Uh, symptoms, we need to focus on rhythm control. How do we control the rhythm? Well, we have, we can control the symptoms with rate control or rhythm control. Rate control does not eliminate AFib. You basically slow the ventricular response so the patient may not feel as much uh, symptoms of irregular heartbeats. It's basically a temporizing measure. There are several drugs that you, you're all familiar, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. I won't dwell on this. Rhythm control. So we can shock the patient out of AFib and then give him antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, sure, that's, those are short-term temporizing measures. Um, when you look at antiarrhythmic drugs, you have to be very careful as to what's the underlying structural disease of the patient. Patients with um, heart failure cannot take any of the class one antiarrhythmic drugs, only amiodarone and doferolide are, are, are available because the others could actually increase mortality. Patients with coronary artery disease may be better uh, served with Sorolo. Um, patients with normal hearts can take a bunch of drugs. Usually you start with flecainide propafenone. The interesting thing is that catheter ablation is applicable to any substrate uh, of uh, any structural substrate for atrial fibrillation. Now, catheter ablation, what is it about? Well, if we think about the mechanisms of AFib, my first slide showed you this pulmonary vein firing uh, abnormal beats leading to AFib. That is an oversimplification that we like to tell patients and industry loves, but it's far more complex. There's a lot of mechanisms of AFib that we don't really understand. There's nerves on, in, in the surface of the left atrium that can trigger AFib. Uh, that can, uh, there's ectopic fossa that can fire electricity from the pulmonary veins. There's electrical reentry, so electri electricity spinning in the back of the left atrium leading to AFib. It's not so clear, but what we do when we ablate AFib is we basically create scar tissue around the pulmonary veins. Scar tissue in different patterns, and that really is up to the operator, whatever they prefer. Pulmonary vein isolation with two circles of, of ablation of scar tissue in each pulmonary vein pair with these two oval scars uh, that can maybe connected with different, um, I'm gonna use this because I don't have battery there different lines connecting uh, the two uh, circles around the pulmonary veins. Some people advocate a more um, broad ablation approach. The truth is we don't know exactly what we're doing, but somehow it works. <laughs> Whether it is pulmonary vein isolation, we achieve pulmonary vein isolation. And sometimes you see AFib that remains in the pulmonary vein and the rest of the heart goes into sinus. And you, then you think, wow, I really understood this patient's AFib came from that pulmonary vein. But many times, you ablate the pulmonary veins, the patient is still in AFib, you shock them, and they stay in sinus. How? I don't know. But it seems to work. <laughs> so we can all, you know, one thing, my, my former boss used to make fun of electrophysiologists because see, he always said, you know, you guys, if you can't convince, confuse. <laughs> <laughs> and, <clears throat> and that's... That's the status we are in with AFib. <laughs> however the mechanism is, however the mechanism works, really it seems to work. And you know, different approaches have been, have been advocated for different, for different patients. Uh, pulmonary vein isolation is the message that, that basically should be uh, a take home message for you guys. That we burn in the left pulmonary vein and around the left, the, in the pulmonary veins, in the back of the left atrium to achieve electrical disconnection of those areas. How does this work? Well, it works pretty good at, at reducing symptoms compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, so if you look at uh, ablation on the top versus antiarrhythmic drugs, it's pretty good eliminating symptoms up to many, around 70, 80%. These are patients that had failed previous antiarrhythmics. So if you give them more, you're always gonna, you, you know you're gonna fail because the, these patients were selected because they had previously failed. Um, is it a, an appropriate first line to answer the question of the title of, of the talk? The truth is there have been several studies that show uh, variably that it does better, ablation does better at rhythm control than antiarrhythmics as a fair line, first line of treatment. That's not the same thing as saying it should be done uh, as a first line of treatment because I don't think it, it should be done because some patients will respond to antiarrhythmics not all of them, statistically less than ablation, 
but what's wrong with trying that first? And I'll show you a few, a few examples. So the first study showed, of course, the patients in the pulmonary vein isolation group did had less, um, less uh, let me see this one really fast. All right. Patients on the, in the uh, PV isolation group had less symptoms and survival free of AFib compared to the antiarrhythmic drug group. Um, if you look at the burden of AFib, and this is a complex slide, but what they did is they took a bunch of patients, each, each of these dots is a patient, and they look at the percentage of the time in AFib in different uh, halters over two years in ablation versus drug therapy. And this is the, the kind of the summary at the, this, the last column. Sure, this, the blue dots here are, seem to be lower, closer to zero than the, than the drug therapy, but not dramatically. Uh, and in a bunch of patients, 77% uh, of the patients, let's focus on this uh, column, were absolutely free from AFib in the patients that had ablation versus 65 drug therapy. So to go back to my point, sure, ablation does better than drug therapy as a first line of therapy, but that doesn't mean that you have to try that first because a fair amount, uh, a fair amount of patients will be fine on drug therapy as a first line. So I typically don't don't, let me just skip this, don't um, try ablation as a first line of therapy, knowing that if, if, able, if, a, if a patient fails on antiarrhythmic drugs, it's time to switch. There's no point in going through the entire list of, of antiarrhythmic drugs. If a patient tries an antiarrhythmic drug and it doesn't work, it's time to do an ablation because we know that the uh, recurrence rate is a lot less if you look at ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs. There's no point in insisting once they have failed. But as a first line, sure, I'd try that first. So just to summarize, in some patients, uh, you will get uh, success um, with antiremic drugs. If they haven't had any prior antiremic drugs, the success rate of antiremics is 84, 93 when you, try, when you do ablation, but that's still, is worth trying. Uh, and it's similar for other studies. If you have failed an antiarrhythmic drug, Success rate of all the antiremic drugs is 7%, 19%. That's dismal. So if you have failed, you better, you better go, which one do you want to be? The 81% success or the 7% success? It's, it's just, it doesn't, uh, doesn't resist a minimal analysis. When you have failed an antiremic drug, do an ablation. But as a first line, you may get success in a substantial number of patients with, uh, with ablation. What is the price? The price is risk of tamponade, risk of TIA stroke, a potentially fatal risk of, I'm doing a terrible job with this, a potentially fatal risk of um, uh, atrioesophageal fistula. You can perforate the esophagus and get a communication between esophagus and the left atrium, which means saliva can go to the left atrium. We don't want to get that because it could be fatal. Uh, we have all kinds of tools to, to prevent that with high sensitive uh, temperature sensors in the esophagus, but no matter how you put it, there's been a lot of bad things reported with ablation. And to make this procedure viable, a viable strategy, we need to minimize this. And you know, in centers of excellence like us, when we do more than 500 a year, we got this down. But we have to be really, really careful and watchful when we do procedures like this because disaster can lurk sometimes. Um, the bottom line is we do achieve a decent job at solving the problem for the patient and taking care of symptoms. Do we do anything beyond symptoms? Does ablation prevent stroke? We don't know yet. There's a Cabana trial that is undergoing right now that will look at this and tell us whether ablation can prevent stroke as much as um, antiarrhythmics with the benefit that you don't have symptoms because when you do an ablation, the goal is to get rid of the disease. You don't just prevent the stroke. You get rid of the, the disease. The rhythm is normal. You don't have AFib anymore. Um, there's some observational studies that suggest that we could do as well as sinus rhythm with a successful ablation. This is one, and there's some others. Um, it's very, this is a very complex uh, slide that divides patients with different risk uh, factors as, uh, and looks at the re risk of stroke uh, in ablation versus no ablation. But I'm, I can summarize it that when the ablation works, the, the stroke rate is similar to that of sinus rhythm. That means it worked but still is, is being studied in a prospective study. These are all registry data that again show that overall ablation without recurrence, so ablation success 
has a much reduced incidence of stroke and vascular events compared to patients with AFib and medical therapy. That means no, 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 no elimination of the disease or ablation that fails. So we'll hear from the Cabana trial, which has been going on for five years, um, but the registry data indicates that ablation can actually solve these problems. These outcome issues of stroke uh, can be reduced with ablation when it works. These are just the sites that are enrolling in the Cabana trial that we would, will give us a lot of information. So to summarize, when is ablation appropriate? Very simple, like in every other procedure, whenever the benefits outweigh the risks. And for that, we need to individualize, and we need to take into consideration the AFib heterogeneity, the symptoms, the burden, the structural disease, the prognostic impact of uh, AFib in a given patient, which could be different. We need to assess whether antiarrhythmic drugs can work and it work, they work better in paroxysmal than in persistent. They work better in, some, in the absence of structural heart disease. You need to deal with compliance if you choose drugs. And then ablation success is not the same in paroxysmal versus persistent, and it has its own risks. Once you put everything together, then you decide with the patient. This is one situation where you really want to have the patient take co-responsibility with you in deciding what to do. And then ablation can definitely be an, a solution for them long-term. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.